folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, I'm again. And this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G-O-R-G double E S Emil dot Gorgis at Tokyo Realty dot JP. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right. So for today's episode, this is a conversation that I've had late last year with a new client. He's been living in Tokyo for a long while now, originally from the US, and we've been in touch for a few years already. He's attended our last seminar in Tokyo back in the days when people could actually have face-to-face -face seminars, remember that? And he's now in the position of pulling the trigger on his first property investment. So this one's quite an advanced chat, a deeper dive into some of the topics that we usually discuss more generally here on the podcast when we speak to potential clients who are just getting to know the market. So we talk about the advantage of owning multiple smaller investment properties versus a single asset or two which basically means investing in buildings versus individual units, advantages, disadvantages of both. We also cover tenant profiles and tenant turnover, the cost of renovations between tenants, uh, investment loans criteria, the loan application process itself. We touch on locations, prices, yields, of course, and we talk a bit about aged buildings, uh, demolitions, buyouts, development projects, and so on and so forth. A really comprehensive conversation with, I think, plenty of tidbits and aspect of the investment process that we often mention in passing here on the podcast, but this time we go a little bit deeper into. So enjoy the chat and I'll see you again on the other side. Okay, so just um, looking at your email now, um, I do agree. Um, so you were asking about um, diversity of income streams um, as opposed to um, getting a, a few properties as opposed to a single one for the same budget. Yeah. So, uh, I def sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I, I basically thought, uh, <clears throat> I was basically just thinking that since, um, since there's inevitably going to be some kind of um, gap in the rentals because of vacancies, people moving, you know, coming in and out, and you know, it might be a month or two or something like that. Um, if there were more than one, even if it means they were smaller, I mean, for the same budget, it might be true that um, <clears throat> those gaps would not occur all at the same time. So essentially, instead of income going to zero for a couple of months, it would just, you know, maybe reduce by, you know, some percentage and maybe on a more often Yes, so so that's that's hundred percent correct. Plus, it gives you more diversity, um, especially if you're buying multiple units in different, uh, slightly different locations, slightly different tenant profiles. So it gives you a bit more uh, socioeconomic, geographical diversity as well. Um, mm -hmm. And within the budget that you've specified, they're not going to be necessarily, uh, um, you know, the the bottom end of the scale, cheapest possible cash cows. Um, so I wouldn't be too concerned about the tenant profile. The only thing to consider is that um, it's probably going to be a singles apartments or maybe couple before they have children kind of apartments, mm, um, yeah. which just means higher tenant uh, turnover. That's all. So whereas, uh, you know, a family sized unit or, or house usually, and um, the same tenant would stay in place for a longer period of time, whereas 
um, singles or people that have just gotten married and so forth are just, I mean, their life circumstances uh, tend to change a bit more often. So you would have more tenant turnover. Um, not necessarily okay. a bad thing, but. What's the, um, I mean, what's, how does that compare? I mean, yeah, I understand that, you know, single people are probably going to be moving around a lot more, but is it like, you know, once or twice a year as opposed to once every five years, or is it is it not no. quite that? No, so your typical single or couple without children would normally stay in place for an average of four to five years. So let's call it four and a half. Um, whereas a family will probably stay in place um, eight or 10 years um, at, a, at a given stretch. And that's, again, that's statistical. I mean, obviously we've got single tenants in place for 20 odd years and we've got families that moved in a couple of years after they moved. Uh, uh, moved out a couple of years after they moved in, but statistically on average, I'd say four and a half years for singles and then um, eight to 10 years for uh, families. Okay, then it's not that much different. So the yield is probably, is probably worth going after for the, for the smaller places now. Yeah, with, with just the slight caveat that whenever a tenant moves out, you do need to spruce up the property. Whereas if you got a tenant in there for eight to 10 years, um, you wouldn't need to replace the wallpapers uh, most likely while they're still in residence, for example. Yeah, but if it's going to be, you know, if it's going to be on average four and a half years, I mean, even if, even if it's something, you know, three or three years are over, it's, that's probably not really going to be that big a dent, I would ima wouldn't imagine. What, what is the, the sprucing up done just guessing based on places that I've rented before is probably on, on the order of between one and two months rent, most likely? Um, depending on the length of the tenancy. So we usually see in these um, studio or let's call it up to 1DK sort of apartments, we're usually looking at um, something like uh, 50,000 to 80,000 yen per year of tenancy, roughly. So if they've been there for a period of two years, then yes, you're looking at a couple of months of rent. But if somebody's moved out after eight or 10 years, it'll obviously be steeper than that. What makes that? I mean, there's got to be a cap at some point because there's only so many things you can replace. Um, well, a lengthy tenancy, again, tenant profiles can change that a little bit, but let's take a worst case scenario. You've had a um, elderly gentleman in a property who's been there for say, you know, 15 years, which is not uncommon in Japan. And when they move out, they're more likely than other tenants to have, you know, constantly kept the windows closed, smoked in the apartment, didn't really give much thought to uh, mold accumulating in the bathroom and that sort of thing. And so after a certain period of time, you might suddenly have to change the bathroom if it's, you know, 20, 25 years old and it's been um, neglected, not, not, you know, intentionally damaged, but neglected. And then you could suddenly be looking at, say, 800,000 yen to replace the uh, unit bath, for example. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. That sort of thing. And whereas if you've had, uh, say, um, let's take the, um, the opposite ideal tenant, which is, say, a single lady in her 40s or 50s, she'd be taking much better care of the apartment and will probably stay there a lot longer as well. Okay. So again, everybody so else kind of falls in between. Yeah. So again, it's kind of statistical depending on yeah. Yeah, the luck of the draw. All right. And uh, your second question, location-wise, so um, to satisfy lender requirement, you mentioned that we need to stay within Kanto Kanagawa, most likely. Well, if it's going to be a if it's going to be a, a building, a multi-unit building, and if I go with the with Prestia as the as the um, the bank um, yeah. specifically for the because I can deal with them, you know, locally and and in mostly in English. Yeah. Um, they it's um. I think this Chiba, Chiba, Tokyo, Saitama, and Kanagawa is is their limit for what they'll they'll loan against. But of course, you know, if you if you were to find something in some other area, you know, like down down you know in your direction or something, and and you knew of a bank down there to be willing to do to do the lending, I mean, I I have no problem with that. It's just you know just because because me dealing with the Japanese banks up here all entirely in Japanese. Um, is is a little bit more of a hassle and it'd be easier to you know to follow the Prestia rules and deal with them. Yeah, well, but that's I mean, essentially any listing agent which would be um, 
putting properties out on the market would have their own bank connection. So they could definitely assist with an application for a loan. But it would, okay. in the vast majority of cases, it, I'd say 99% of cases, it would be your typical Japanese lender. So it would have to be done in Japanese. Well, if the, yeah, if there's somebody on the other end that's 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 assisting us, because I know when when we bought our um, our residence um, where I'm at right now, um, the sell the, the buying agent actually um, picked three banks that he's dealt with before, um, brought all of the the forms over, you know, helped make sure you know make checked them over, made sure we were filling them out all all correctly, and nothing was missing or anything. But that's that's the major thing is like. If there's some kind of like really important thing in fine print and italics at the bottom says don't forget to do such and such a thing and on if i don't spot that then you know the application doesn't go through and yeah so similar similar scenario they definitely assist with that but um i'm not sure if Presti are in in the practice of providing um uh, pre-approval letters of intent kind of thing because that always helps when we submit an application if it is going to be under a mortgage yeah, they said they don't do pre-approval. They, they don't do pre-approval. Me. Okay. Do pre-approval. And um, the, my regular SNBC, the, the non presti SNBC, which is where I do my regular banking, I have my mortgage loan. Um, they don't have anybody in the branches to talk to at all. They said you have to do it all online. And mm-hmm. I went online. It's like it's all in Japanese. And the, the very first place where they send you is, is the form to fill out what's the address of the property etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'm guessing that they probably no pre-approval as well getting a pre-approval from them is probably going to be you know a matter of you know finding somebody that that knows what they're what they're talking about that's not an online you know form somewhere yeah okay so that's not no no huge um preference to i mean going with them would be easy if we're keeping it in english but otherwise no huge preference there not really um not not if um not if we can put the loan through um yeah, I mean, I'm fine with filling the form out. I can, I can read basic things like, you know, put your name here, put, you know, your address here, stuff like that. But in terms of, like I said, checking it over to make sure we didn't miss anything or, or knowing, you know, being, being able to talk to the guy at the bank when, you, when the form gets submitted and say, okay, here's this, here's this application. That's probably about the limit I'd be able to tell them. Well, here's this application. You know, let me know what happens. And yeah. anything more detailed than that, um, it would be, better to have somebody that actually spoke natively well you would need to um you would need to attend uh, at least one single meeting with the bank officials before the loan gets approved and that is in japanese although it's fairly basic japanese they just want you to confirm who you are and you want to purchase the property then you understand the terms and so forth Mm -hmm. um and i mean if the agent that we happen to be dealing with is not you know particularly outgoing in that regard then i mean you can always engage us to join you on the meeting and um, provide interpretation to some degree but the bank will want to see that you're actually understanding what you're signing in japanese so oh yeah yeah okay okay so as long as that's not an issue we can definitely look at other places but i mean look in um yokohama saitama chiba city we should definitely be able to find some good deals around there if you do prefer to stick to that to those areas i mean central tokyo kawasaki might be a bit more challenging um but um, yes yeah, budget i imagine <laughs> uh, budget and yield would be very low oh okay yeah but um the, yeah saitama be- yokohama again chiba city definitely should be doable okay it's so a tokyo central tokyo is mainly because there's a a lot a large number of a lot of competition maybe. um it's just a very hyped up and overinflated market i mean when japan's economy does well central tokyo and osaka are the first to uh, spring upwards and fukuoka has been following suit in recent years but fukuoka still has a lot more room to grow compared to tokyo and osaka they're pretty much at their pre-bubble day level so yeah. um it's just not super attractive properties unless you plan to get creative with them and run them as airbnb businesses or anything of that sort yeah no, i mean uh, i would really be, the rules the rules here are a little bit a little bit stranger than you know like in the states or, or other places so yes yes they're more constrictive and it also it becomes a kind of a half you know maybe not a full-time job but definitely half a job just to keep track of uh, uh registration well, sure. and bookings and so forth so well, after March, I won't have a full-time job. So, I mean, maybe not. I, that hasn't been decided yet. But um, are you in the mood to become a short-term stay operator, though? <laughs> not, not, 
really you know <laughs> so if I mean, we're talking just... long-term leases i'd probably stick to um, anything out of central tokyo yeah no i have no problem with ge geographically with other with other areas um you know outside of the outside of the kanto region the only the only restriction with the condo region is if i really you know planned on going with prestia but if you say like there's other lenders that that especially you know i would imagine i don't know for sure but i mean i think in the states it kind of works this way if um if the lenders loaning on something a property that's local they, they sometimes feel a little bit more comfortable because they know you know more about the area and now all right this isn't some you know slum off on the you know edge of the river about to fall into you know, the drink or something. Yeah, which is where the real, the listing agent's relationship with their existing, I mean, normally, especially with the bigger agencies, they'd have a, a dedicated loan officer that they regularly communicate with at the bank. Yeah. So it is easier on that regard. But having said that, with Prestia, we've got the advantage of that they'd be quite comfortable working with foreigners, whereas some local, um, you know, some local Fukuoka or, or Kumamoto or whatever lender might not have had the experience. So to just be a bit more uh, friction there that's all but i mean we can uh, definitely yeah. we can definitely try for both and if we find out that it's you know becoming a bit too challenging on the lender side we'll just stick to those areas we interrupt this broadcast i always wanted to say this we interrupt this broadcast to tell you about tokyo family stays they're a short-term rentals company in tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience which is just perfect for remote working quarantining or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world so they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now, the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really, the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens. And they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short-term stays, drop them a line today see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G-O-R-G-E-E-S, at tokyorealty.jp. Yeah, okay. And of course, um, if it's, you know, if it's smaller places in a cash deal rather than a, rather than a whole building, um, which is fine with me because, um, you know, for the, for the duration of, of the loan, which is probably like 10 years, I mean, given my age, they're, they're only going to give me 10 years usually. Yeah. And, um, and so for the duration of the loan, I think the amount of cash that the, that the, um, that this endeavor would generate is probably going to be about the same for a larger building with a 50% loan as it would be if we just went for a couple smaller places. So I'm not really sure that it's going to make that big a difference. I mean, I'm fine with just, just sticking with, you know, a couple of smaller, you know, smaller yep. single units. Oh, we can try both. The, I mean, the main advantage with purchasing an entire building as opposed to individual units is, number one, the flexibility of potentially doing uh, monthly rentals or short-term rentals, or in the future, converting the entire block into something completely different, which is obviously something you're not going to be able if you're buying something in a co-owned yeah. owner union situation. And the other advantage is you've got more potential growth if and when that particular area gains in value, you've got a bigger land parcel. So obviously what gains in japan mm, is only the yeah, land okay. so the bigger the parcel the more potential uh, for capital growth you've got 
Um, having said yeah, that, okay. comparing locations is a big deal as well. So if we happen to buy a small building that's quite suburban, um, then central units in uh, more central locations in cities might also gain more than that building. So, um, I mean, well, look, we can sort of take a few case studies and, and try both of them and see what clicks for you and then just pursue the one that we're uh, more comfortable with. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that's fine. I mean, both, you know, both options are, um, are open and, and it sounds, it sounds like there's really not, I mean, other than, you know, a few advantages here and there, I think, cause this, if it works out, this is probably, you know, just the first, you know, first shot, I've got other money that I could bring over later, you know, if this, if this really works out. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, well, I just, I'm, I'm look, I'm looking mainly as I was, as I had mentioned in the email before, I'm looking mainly, um, you know, I've got pretty much all of my assets in the States right now in, um, in the markets. And it's been a great run. I'm glad, you know, I'm, in a way, I'm kind of glad that I didn't jump on this when you know when i first went to your seminar because you know i mean in the last couple of years the markets are up you know quite a bit a, a yeah. heck of a lot more than than real estate has been but um that's things don't go up forever you know i mean i realize that and so uh, i'm looking for you know let's set something uh, i'm trying to set myself up so that you know even if markets stay flat or or draw down which is which is fairly likely in the next few years i would imagine um it won't it won't really be that much of an impact um, income wise in, in retirement because I'll have, you know, kind of a, a, a diversity across, across continents, basically. Yeah. And plus residential property in Japan, considering Japan doesn't really have mass layoffs or uh, people defaulting on their um, rent payments on a regular basis. That, that is pretty much, I wouldn't say recession proof, but definitely recession uh, resistant. So it's more uh, stable. Yeah, it's a good it's a good thing to diverge uh, into. So I guess, um, well, I mean, if you're just testing the waters, why don't we just go for the easy route and start with um, cash purchase individual units, and then if and oh, actually the one the one um, concern there is like you mentioned your age and also the fact that you might not be employed for next year. So that's um, your income is the only thing that Japanese lenders look at. They don't care about any other assets that you might have. There's no drawing on equity or anything of that sort. Um, so if you do want to make sure that you can get your financing before your income stream becomes a bit more creative, because they wouldn't look at the income coming in from overseas. And I don't think that your rental income from whatever you're going to be buying is going to be enough to satisfy them. Yeah, so, so there um, is a case to be made here for maybe applying for a loan before it becomes more challenging. Right. If that's yeah, if that's like I think in a couple several emails ago, I think I said if if that's possible, like I'm guessing between now and the end of the year because there will be some time for paperwork and you know all, all of that. But I mean, if yeah, if we can, if you find something and then we can get it pushed through financing, you know, while I'm while I still have um, while you regular qualify, income. yeah, while I qualify, yeah. yeah, then that then that would be that would be great. And then and if it doesn't work out, I'm I'm fine, you know, I'm fine with uh, just the cash purchases as well. And then okay. of course later okay. purchases might might end up having to be you know cash purchases. But so between you know, now to the end of this year, you mean you want to submit a loan? Are you going to be um, officially unemployed from 2022? End of March, actually, is when my, my contract goes to the end of March. Okay, so that, that gives us a bit of leeway. Okay, so yeah. you know what? In that case, let's focus on that first. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll prioritize the areas that are easier for us to deal with, meaning Prestia areas. And I'll also mm -hmm. include a few um, outliers in maybe other locations just so we can test the waters with another lender, maybe. Okay. Would, okay, so would... the budget we've mentioned there is um, approximately 50 mil, assuming that you're going to put in 30, 40% cash deposit, right? Right. Okay, so that gives me, um, I think, enough to go on. And otherwise, um, I mean, we would normally recommend buildings that have been built in the last 20 years or so, just because beyond that, maintenance starts piling up a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, for individual units, maybe 30. But if we're focusing on building, I'd probably advise 20 or um, 20 or less. And 
within 10, maybe 15 minutes to a station at most. Um, yeah. And only if it's, a, I mean, 15 minutes would be maybe okay if it's a main kind of major station, but if it's a suburban, we'd probably stick to 10 minutes to a station. Okay. Yeah. Any, makes... any other criteria that springs to mind? Yeah, not, yeah, not really. Um, we covered the building age. I mean, that would be my, my biggest worry is because, um, I mean, what happens if I bought an individual unit in an older building and then at some point that building has to be torn down? I mean, that's, that happens. Well, I developers mean, will tend to swoop in far before that ever reaches that point. So what you'll find is that once the building approaches 40 years, um, developers will start coming in and uh, making offers. So um, I mean, we've never had a case where a building was actually even considering demolish. It would usually bought out under us um, far before that. It's not necessarily a good thing like it is in other countries, though. I mean, they don't make... Um, irresistible offers. I mean, they try to buy at uh, market price or less. Right. But assuming that you would have by then accumulated at least five, six, seven years of, uh, of rental income, then even at market price would be okay. Be fine, uh, yeah. But with individual units, again, we would advise 30 years and younger, not necessarily because of um, uh, the livability of the structure itself, but because of the fact that there's a new legislation that supposedly... It was meant to come in next year and now they've sort of postponed it to an unknown date, but at some point it will come in. That's going to place a bigger onus on owner unions to better renovate and um, conduct repairs on the buildings to avoid mismanagement, which is sometimes mm -hmm. the case. And the, the idea that the government had was to issue a compliance certificate to owner unions that step up. And what we think that might do is, um, on the one hand, if they choose to comply, it might mean that they'll have to suddenly um, sharply jack up building fees just to uh, live up to their obligations. Or if they choose not to comply, then they might be, uh, it might sort of create a, two markets, one for certified and one for un uncertified properties, in which case, if they choose not to comply, then your value might sort of fall off a cliff. So until that legislation becomes a bit clearer, at least, we're usually recommending not to go for anything older than 30 years so that if in five, six years time you want to offload it, you'd still be able to get a reasonable price for it. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But with buildings, if you own the entire structure and all of the maintenance is on you, then we'd probably advise 20 years or less if possible. Um, maybe 22, 23 years if it looks like a really good deal, but otherwise 20 years. Okay. I would imagine in this in the um, in the whole building market, then you were saying that the developers come swooping in, you know, when it gets to over a certain age. I would imagine that happens with the whole buildings as well, right? Um, yeah, but then I mean, there's no. The thing is with owner unions, then the developers can be tricky in the sense that they'll, for example, they they'll first buy off um, two or three or four units in the building at sort of normal price so that they get a vote on the owner union uh, council. And then once they're in, they'll try to slowly push and convince people to sell at a cheaper price. And um, because not all of the owners would be very savvy, it's easy for the developers to sort of scare them into selling, oh, look, you're, gonna, you're gonna, right. not gonna find tenants, you're not gonna, you know, maintenance will be killing you. And they don't, they can't really do that if you're the only owner, right? If you own the entire building, then, you know, they can try, but, you know, it's, right. it's, only, it's just okay. your call. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, they don't. Um, with selling the entire building, all they need is eighty percent um, voting, um, voting eyes, and then they can pretty much. I mean, they, the the twenty percent who voted no would still own the units, but then they uh, whoever bought the building can just slowly stop providing uh, utilities to those units and just sort of force them out. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I doesn't that. exist. I mean, this sort of tactics don't work if you own the entire structure and you're the only one making the call. I would imagine with an entire structure too, if it got old enough, there's probably because otherwise, otherwise this wouldn't really wouldn't really work for other developers. But I mean, there's probably some way to actually just replace it with something better and you know juice the juice the income that way. Um, I mean, I, I understand that's a whole different business. If you got the capital just, for it, for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, wouldn't wouldn't um, wouldn't banks be willing to lend against something like that? I mean, construction loan, whatever. I don't know how that, that business um, really works. 
sure they, do, be they do, but again, we're running into the same sort of um, constraints of um, your age and income status. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, I mean, they, they, they're a lot, they're not, they don't have a problem with lending to owners, occupiers to construct their own homes. When mm. you're constructing an investment property, then they're a bit more picky on what they approve. They much rather see a property that's already generating income than a speculative project. Mm. But having said that, if you've got, you know, if you've got a few years of experience as a property investor and you show them that you've been doing this and running this on your own and you, you're experienced and they might be more open to it. But again, then your age and um, other income comes into play. Okay. So I wouldn't, I, mean, I wouldn't count on it. I guess, bottom line, I wouldn't count on yeah. them approving that. Yeah, well, I'm not necessarily counting on that. Like I say, I'm not really sure I want to be in the construction business, but, you know. Yeah, that's I mean, a maybe... whole, whole different kettle of fish, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's possible. It seems to me it might be possible to find a partner that is in that, is in that business and, and would be willing to, you know, share the profits or something and say, you know, we're going to, you know, this building's old enough, we're going to tear it down, we're going to put something really spiff in its place and, and, and rent it out and, you know, split the profit, but proceeds somehow. Yep. I mean, that might yep. be a possibility. I don't know. Yep, I mean, I, that, again, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure I want to be in that business. It's doable, but I mean, bear in mind that the people who do this on a regular basis, like small scale developers and so forth, um, usually have access to financing and can pretty much pull off these projects on their own. So they're not really, we've tried in the past, we've had some customers who are looking to get into a partnership with developers, but the feeling that we got from the replies from them is that they're not really interested in partnering. They can pretty much handle things on their own. And yeah. so unless you've got a personal acquaintance with somebody who's entering this in a, you know, on a personal level with you as a project that they're interested in, it's not going to be easy to find, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Probably locating a, locating a reasonable, reasonable uh, lot to put their building on. is probably pretty easy. Yeah. And a lot of them would just prefer to buy land and construct on their own because they, they have access to financing as a company that's been doing it for a while. So they don't really need partners most of the time. Yeah, it just fits into the pattern. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Well, all right, just, just okay. the back of the mind. So right. um, I'll stop the recording uh, so that you can ask me any other more personal questions. But otherwise, just to summarize, so we're going to be... Um, looking at buildings first, just to see if we can get a loan going, um, focusing, I'd say, maybe 70% around the uh, uh, Kanagawa Kanto area and maybe a few outlayers uh, for the rest of the search sure. yeah. and see what we come up with there. Okay, so let me just yeah. pause the recording. So there you go. As promised, a little bit shorter than usual, but definitely not superficial. Good deep dive into the various options and aspects of property investment here in Japan. I really enjoy speaking with clients who have a bit more of a budget to work with because, well, we're happy to serve anyone. If you've only got a very limited budget, say 30 to 100,000 US, there really are only so many asset classes that you can look at. You'll be limited to single condo units, uh, maybe a house somewhere in a more rural area, if that's your thing. And while those can be good purchases in their own right, and definitely there's a lot more that you can get here compared with other countries, even at these lower budgets, but having a larger budget naturally gives you a lot more options and diversity, as you've probably noticed in this call. So I do hope it brought you some value. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com. And he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review 
on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time, and until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku! Yoroshiku!